Okay, to the first order of business, we are trying to warm up the room a little bit. Okay, we're going to get started. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the biannual conference of the Shane D. Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing, Inc. Inc. History Community Text. I am Ilana Blumberg, I direct the program, and we're fortunate to have in our audience tonight much of our faculty, Professors Bill Kohlbrenner, Michael Kramer, Evan Fallenberg, Marcella Schulach, Dahlia Rosenfeld, and Linda Ziskwit, our newest colleague in the Department of English, Kara Glatt, and we have as well Sharon Barris, who's taught with us for many years. Of course, there's no one we welcome more warmly than the Rudolph family. Where are you, Rudolph family? Okay. <laughs> who are represented this year by Hedda Rudolph and Sarah, Ulsh Sarah Rudolph Olshin, the mother and sister of the founder of this program, Shandy, who sought to establish what was and remains the first and only Jewish creative writing program in the world. Shandy's vision still very much inspires all our work, and you'll hear more about that in the evening devoted to her memory, Tuesday night. Gathering in Ramat Gan to discuss contemporary Jewish literature written in English may seem very natural to all of us, but it is much thanks to Shane D that such a cultural and linguistic transplantation is possible at all. It's thrilling as well to welcome current students and many of our alumni who also feel like family. I carry greetings from the rector of the university, Dr. Mary Faust, who regrets that she cannot be with us tonight. And finally, we welcome our guest authors who have crossed time zones and oceans to be with us, Deborah Lipstadt and Rachel Kadish, who are here with us this evening. <laughs> Erica Meitner and Ilana Kershan, who will be speaking on Tuesday evening, both here. And Alicia Ostreicher, who joins us especially to celebrate Linda Ziswood, whose retirement we will honor, however sadly, tomorrow evening. This conference has been long in planning and has turned into the sort of event in which simply every single event is a highlight in its own right. Let me say a few words about the conference title and what we anticipate in the next few days. We named this conference Ink Inc. and over the months as I've thought about it, it has become more and more meaningful to me, especially as I've gotten to know the work of our authors even better. Ilana Kershan's beautiful memoir, If All the Seas Were Ink, is titled with a half quotation from a poem taken from Jewish holiday liturgy called Akdamot. Gvurin almin le velos fake prishuta, gvil ilu rekie kne kol horshata, dio elu yame vechome kenishuta, daire ara safre verashme rashvata. Even if all the heavens were parchment, and all the forests quills, if all the oceans were ink, as well as every gathered water, if all the Earth's inhabitants were scribes and recorders of initials, it would not suffice to describe God's words, worlds of glory. The Jewish impulse to sing and to praise, to testify and to describe, is ancient. And yet with it comes the inescapable sense of the insufficiency of the word, of ink, to capture what must be said, to illuminate the truth as we know it, to represent the real, to capture creation. How often it is, as Alicia Ostreicher first instructed a generation of new feminist readers, that women apologize for the insufficiency of their pen, but then, from strategic apology, leap forward into utterly new spheres of creative activity. Words and ink may not be enough, and we humans, women or men, may not be enough, but we are what there is, and ink is what we have. To keep to fixed liturgy, as Erica Meitner asks in her poems, or to break from it, is to ask whether our own ink or someone else's. But poets and writers return inevitably to words and ink. Ink, says the writer Elan Stavins, is literature in potential. Ink can be a splotch, a mess, a chaos. It can mar the page, as it does in Rachel Kadish's novel, when a female scribe must begin again to write after a misstart. It can crumble, it can destroy paper. Yet from the dust of ink, from the chaos of ink, are born records of experience, which when we're fortunate, survive centuries, so that the ink itself is a gift that is the closest thing we have to lost bodies, lost souls, lost historical realities. As Linda Ziskwood has written in her beautiful song to the poet Robert Creeley, 
Your death, your fading voice do not leave silence in your place. Here, history and poetry find a merging point. When a historian finds an archive or even a single letter that testifies to a story we have not known, a truth we may have suspected, or one that we might not have been able to guess, or a, tr a truth we are obligated to prove, as Deborah Lipstadt can attest, ink is not only redemptive, but the nearest thing to justice. So why have we called the conference Ink Ink? Why the second ink? The second ink, I-N-C, comes from the term incorporated, united into one body, combined. This term at first glance reminds me of the capitalist marketplace, where diversities are often merged into conglomerates that can swallow up different voices, and in the mirage of variety, present a prepackaged way of living in the world, choicelessness sometimes masquerading as freedom. But in putting I-N-K alongside I-N-C, I want to suggest something else. Our ink, I-N-C, is the gathering together of those very different voices, those other inks, into something unified and embodied, something collective and weighty that aspires to freedom and that testifies to the most challenging truths. And the repetition of ink, ink, of the same sounds with different meanings, of sounds that pose questions, this repetition is the playfulness and the mystery of all human speech, of creation within constraint. I hope that the voices we've brought together here for you at Barilan will usher you into new thoughts, new collectivities, new liturgies, even new histories. And on behalf of the Shane G. Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing, I wish all of us a wonderful conference, and I hope you'll come back to everything. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Bill Kroll-Brenner, who will deliver the Dvar Torah that opens this evening. A gifted teacher and scholar, Professor Kroll-Brenner teaches creative nonfiction in the program. And his most recent book, The Last Rabbi, Joseph Soloveitchik and Talmudic Tradition, just proves that he can really do anything. Days before the holiday of Shavuot, in the week in which the Sabbath Torah readings bring the Jewish people with the Book of Numbers into the desert, we find ourselves between desert travels and revelation. Biblical revelation represents the paradigm instance of what thinkers from Longinus to Kant have called the sublime, the experience that at once strains and transcends our ways of knowing. The accoutrements of the Shavuot day ritual, commemorating the day of revelation, blintzes, cheesecakes, the decoration of the ark with newly cut leaves and branches, give texture to the celebration, but also may, through our habitual observance, domesticate that moment. The Torah resorts to the description of the spectacle of Revelation, the cloud, the smoldering kiln, the fiery mountain, the ever-increasing sound of the shofar blast. But much of the sublimity of the moment is conveyed through the responses of the people of Israel, the representation of their experience. A contemporary purveyor of the sublime, the essayist Annie Dillard, writes in relation to a different kind of revelation, that of nature. It's all a matter of keeping one's eyes open. The sublime both demands and teaches the necessity of open eyes. Dillard, however, points to Revelation's amb ambiguous nature. If we are blinded by darkness, we are also blinded by too much light. And thus, we all walk about carefully averting our faces, lest our eyes be blasted forever. Of her experience of the sublime, the 1969 solar eclipse in Yakima, Washington, Dillard writes, it had been like dying that sliding down the mountain pass into, into the region of dread. When the eclipse became total, the sun completely obscured, there was, she writes, no world. We were the world's dead people, forgetful of almost everything. Only an extraordinary act of will could recall us to our former living selves. The sublime, as Dillard frames it, in its intensity, dread, even in its tendency towards obliteration, serves the function of keeping our knowledge from blinding us undoing ways of knowing that are impediments to knowledge, allowing the intimation of something beyond. What you see during that moment, Dillard writes of totality, is much more convincing than any wild-eyed theory you may have. But I pray, Dillard cautions soberly, you will never see anything more awful in the sky. Chorev, another name for Mount Sinai, also alludes implicitly to Cherev or Chorban, the light of revelation contains within it the possibilities for destruction. As Freud notes, opposites always come together, informing one another, making one another possible. John Milton in Paradise Lost alludes to Sinai as the secret top, 
a place combining revelation and concealment, while an 18th century editor changes it to the bland sacred top, obscuring how the experience of the sacred entails secrets, perhaps even death. The Exodus account begins with the promise of an exoteric revelation, where God appears to the people in a thick cloud. In the conversation with the privileged prophet of Israel, God tells Moses to ready the people, kidash them. As King James translates it, sanctify them. But more simply, as the Aramaic translation puts it, get them ready. Prepare the people of Israel for the revelation of the divine, one that will appear to the eyes of everyone. Though Moses will lead the people towards God to meet with God, the preparation for closeness, however, entails distancing. The people are instructed to make barriers and further instructed not to touch the barriers, separating them from the divine, lest they break through to the Lord. Moses is told to make the people ready yet again, followed by the synesthetic experience of thunder and lightning, the mountains smoking, quaking, and the sound of the shofar with the response, and the camp trembled. Moses, in a further disappearing act, ascends to the heavens once more for another divine injunction, that he warn the people lest they break through in an attempt to gaze upon the divine. Here the Torah records a back and forth movement, the thirst for a revelation, the just want to see his face so prevalent in the New Testament, but also the terror at such a prospect. Indeed, the injunctions continue with the further caution that the priests especially should refrain from the desire to see the divine, lest God, in the extraordinary anthropomorphism, break out against them. Or as some say, lest the, go the good emanating from the light of the Torah become their evil, the life it promises become their death. As Kant writes, the sublime leads to a double movement, a vibration, the experience of a rapidly alternating repulsion from and attraction to one and the same object, and more, an eventual pleasure only possible through the means of displeasure. The sublime elicits both our attention and terror, our inability to assimilate the experience within normal perceptual category, categories intensifies them both. As Dillard writes of the eclipse, in its deeps are violence and terror. But if you ride those monsters deeper down, you find that our sciences cannot locate or name them. The substrate which buoys the rest and which gives goodness its power for good are complex and inexplicable caring for each other and for our life together here. Revelation, that which cannot be named, in resisting our habitual ways of thinking, leads us to a transcendent awareness. Or as Kant puts, us, puts it, it prepares us to love something somehow pulling us to a higher ethical consciousness. The Torah recounts the response of the people to the experience of revelation. Let not God speak with us, lest we die. So Dillard writes her experience on a Washington mountaintop. We thought we were dead. The, Mid the Midrash similarly describes the experience of those present to the giving of the Torah. With every one of the divine utterances, their souls escape them. Revelation is both the source of life, but also paradoxically death. The Torah recounts that the thunder and lightning caused the people to fall back, the Midrash adding that the angels, in their extraordinary act, pushed them back, protecting them from the revelation which they at once craved and of which they were, and of which they were terrified. Following this revelation comes a seemingly needless repetition of the law, the emphasis of the prohibition of idolatry already mentioned in the Ten Commandments. You shall not make gods of silver, neither shall you make gods of gold. This is as if to say, knowing the infinite, how can you consider trying to encompass the divine and the finite? How can you believe in the fetishized rituals of idolaters? How can you trust in your petty and limiting ideologies, as Dillard puts it, in your crazy theories? Some say that the seemingly redundant second warning to the people of Israel entails not an emphasis on the prohibition against violating a physical barrier, but rather a cognitive one, a caution against the very attempt to imagine the divine. Believing in the possibility of encompassing the divine, of, it, of domesticating the infinite, is bad for you. The infinite resists our conceptions, making all of our imaginings, our formulations, partial and inadequate. And yet, Moses, the Talmudic sages say, went through the deserts, desert traveling with a pinkas, a notebook, Joan Didion before the letter. 
The infinite may haunt us, Dillard again on the eclipse. With great effort, we remembered some sort of circular light in the sky, but only the outline. This vague outline leads us to remember, to write. To be sure, as Dillard writes, the lenses of telescopes and cameras do not do justice to the eclipse. So our cognitive faculties will always fail to capture the infinite. But the writer is left with her two little tools, grammar and a lexicon. And somehow they are enough. And with these tools, she writes, we try to save our lives. We cannot encompass the infinite, but even in its terror, the sublime prepares us, as Kant writes, to love. Milton defines the challenge of revelation in Paradise Lost. To love or not, he writes, in this we stand or fall. The love of the infinite, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. How does one love the transcendent God, the sublime infinite? The words of the Shema continue, the Hayu hadvarim ha'ela, and these words, the infinite may be inaccessible, unknowable, resisting our theories, concepts, and descriptions. The infinite, however, does not demand silence, but rather a love expressed through hadvarim ha'ela, with these words, with our words. The process of writing often seems a lonely desert enterprise. The life of writing, even that of the humanities in general, a persistent, if only faint, testimony to the presence of the infinite in a university environment more and more governed by technocratic rules and vocational training, our contemporary idolatries. In our Shane D. Rudolph creative writing program, we engage in that writing experience together, committed to the sublime that buoys all our pursuits, our Dvarim Ha'ela, our many and varied attempts not to capture the infinite, but to help remind the world, as well as ourselves, that it exists. Enjoy the conference. Uh, I'm going to read just a very short section of their bios that we have them in the program. Um, but I will say that Rachel Kadesh, who you thanks for residing, um, is the award winning author of the novels The Weight of Ink, From a Sealed Room, and Tolstoy Live, a Love Story. She has been a fiction fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. She has just received the National Jewish Book Award. She has received the Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award. It goes on. Um, I want to say about Rachel that she has an extraordinary capacity to write a multi-plot novel. And the reason I say this is because some of you in the audience who've studied with me particularly know that I am a, um, that my field of specialization is the Victorian novel, the 19th century novel. And many people feel that that novel has kind of had its day, it's gone out of fashion. But Rachel has done the extraordinary work of writing an incredibly complicated multi-plot novel that works. Um, it's a novel that travels between landscapes, it travels between languages, it travels between characters, and it does this so seamlessly that I don't think contemporary readers even realize that they're reading um, as, as challenging, uh, as structurally challenging a novel as it actually is. Um, one of the things that amazed me when I was looking at Rachel's uh, material online is that you have about a thousand reader reviews on Amazon. Do you know that? <laughs> so, I, I, the reason I noticed that was because it is remarkable to write a novel that is this challenging and to reach out to that broad an audience. Um, so I found that to be very, very interesting testimony to, um, to a broad readership for challenging work. Um, Deborah Lipstadt, who is with us as well, um, shares something with Rachel, which is the capacity to reach a very broad audience. Um, I can read you endlessly about Deborah's accomplishments and achievements. I'll, I'll read a few of them right here. Um, she's the DeRoad Pref Professor of Holocaust Studies at Emory University. Uh, she's published and taught about the Holocaust for close to 40 years. And as she'll describe to you tonight, one of the things um, that, that she is very well known for is having won a libel lawsuit that was brought um, and she'll tell you a little bit about that later, but one of the things that came out of that lawsuit was a capacity to reach quite a broad audience, um, a popular audience, through a different form of writing, not necessarily a purely scholarly form of writing. Um, what I'd like to say about Deborah um, is, having known you for a number of years now, that you have an incredibly strong sense of personal integrity a clarity of vision that makes you a model public intellectual, 
Um, you seem to always know what you think, which is admirable. Um, and My I think, sister wouldn't agree with you being admirable. <laughs> but there's something remarkable about how down-to-earth Deborah can be com combined with, with this formidable intelligence that sizes things up quickly and knows how to put them into words at precisely the moment they need to be put into words. Some people need a lot of time to process things and to understand what the right response is, and I think Deborah never misses the moment, and that's quite a gift. Um, so I think we have beside us here tonight two remarkable Jewish women of letters, and it has been a kind of um, fantasy of mine to get them together here and to ask them about how they write and what they write and when they know what their projects are. Um, so, so please join me first of all in welcoming these two wonderful writers. Now, some people have asked me in the last couple of weeks, what am I doing with a historian and a novelist on stage together? And even my guests, I think, may have had moments of wondering, and some of my colleagues. Um, but I think this is a wonderful pairing. And I wanted to begin by asking Rachel, who is a novelist who has written a very, very deeply historical novel, um, how, Rachel, do you research? Why do you research? Why do you write about history? Um, how is it that you begin a project that's set in the past? And then we'll turn to, De to Deborah, who is a professional historian, and talk to her a little bit as well about her research, where it begins, how she does it, and try to think about some of the commonalities and differences in these experiences. Thank you so much. Can, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. I'm so excited to be on the stage with you. So, um, so that was um, the question about where I get started with history, what draws me to it, um, has a lot of different answers, and so I'm gonna try to be brief. I've always been um, in love with history, fascinated by history. I think that um, my approach to history is always wanting to um, see it through an emotional magnifying glass, you know, you can tell a story through a, a, in a miniaturizing way, which often we have to. Sometimes when you're trying to sum up big historical or political trends, you have to say 10,000 people were displaced by this flood. That's emotionally miniaturizing because it doesn't let us feel what it's like to be one of those people, but sometimes we just need those miniaturizing facts because we have to comprehend the scale of things. On the other hand, to understand what that really means for every one person, what that feels like, you have to go in the emotional magnifying glass direction. And I think that's one thing that historical fiction does very well because it can take you to, okay, here's what's it like to be one person in the middle of this? What's it like not just to be, you know, theoretically one person, but one person, you know, in a body, walking, trying to find food, all of that. And that's, that's the kind of thing that historical fiction, I think, tends to illuminate beautifully. Certain kinds of creative nonfiction as well. Um, I grew up, uh, my, um, my, mother's, my mother was born on the run, her parents were Holocaust survivors, so I grew up with uh, the sense that history was always popping up and kind of smacking you in the head when you least expected it. You know, I, yeah, yes, that's when we were in the Russian prison, past the salt. Um, and, and I don't think, but I don't think that experience of history is unique to, to a refugee experience. I mean, we're all swimming in history all the time. Particularly in the US, people forget that. They think history is this other thing. And I have to say to my students, no, you're in history right now. Um, but when, history from the past pops up and, and we have to figure out how it's going to affect us and how we're going to respond to it. You can ignore it or you can react to it. I think that's what draws me to this idea of a multi-layered historical novel where documents pop up in the present and they reveal something about the past and you have to figure out what the past has to say to us today. So that's, I think, where structurally I came at this novel. Um, I had a, a particular, well, I can say how I started writing this particular novel, but I don't know if you want to. Yeah, why don't you just tell us for a moment where okay. this, the idea for this particular okay. novel came So I, I tend to start writing when something's bugging me and I don't know quite what I think about it. There's a Henry James quote I love, which is, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And often if something's bugging me, I don't know, I have to, I have to start writing about it. So uh, a bunch of years ago, um, there were, um, that was deliberately vague. It took me a long time to write this novel, <laughs> many years ago. Um, and uh, there were two things in particular bugging me. Um, one, uh, maybe we'll get to later, it has to do with the Masada story. But the second one was a quote uh, from Virginia Woolf, this question of, 
If William Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister, what would have been the fate of that woman? And Wolf's answer is very brief and very depressing. It's, she died young, alas, she never wrote a word. Now, you can't argue that that is the most likely outcome, but I couldn't stop sort of shadow boxing, you know, what if, what if? What would it take for a woman not to die without writing a word? A woman with a capacious mind in that era, not necessarily a, a playwright, but, um, you know, and, and what if she were poor? What if she were Jewish? At least further, you know, difficulties to get any access to education and, and the right to speak. And so I wanted to write a historical novel exploring that question. And I, um, I started looking into it. I thought, what time period am I going to write about? And I started learning about the 17th century Jewish community of Amsterdam. And when I say I knew nothing about this, I didn't know Amsterdam's Jews were Sephardic, mainly. I didn't know they were Inquisition refugees. I didn't know they'd excommunicated Spinoza. I didn't know Spinoza was Jewish. I was scared of philosophy. I didn't any, none of this. Um, but I was reading in Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein's book, Be Betraying Spinoza, which is an amazing book. And she talked about the excommunication ban on Spinoza and how it was unprecedented. Before that, in this community, excommunication was like a slap on the wrist. You're excommunicated for two weeks. So you say you're sorry. You know, that was it. And then when they communicated Spinoza, it's absolute fire and brimstone stuff. There wasn't a precedent. In it. I heard they had to actually go to the Catholic Church for the language for it. God's fury will smoke against him. Lifetime ban on him and on anyone who had contact with him. And it suddenly all clicked for me. You could hear the fear in that document. 350-year-old document. You could hear how scared these people were. They had found a perch of safety in Amsterdam. This guy was messing it up for them. He was breaking the rules. He was sounding, frankly, atheist, and he was going to get them in trouble. And suddenly it all, I thought, oh, I know these people. They're refugees. And I grew up around refugees, that sense of that brittle sense of safety and this beautiful, fierce determination to rebuild and all the things that come out of that. And it was very familiar to me. So I thought, OK, this is the community I'm going to write about. And I started, and I, I don't outline in advance. Happy to talk about that or not later, but about why I can't outline. But so I just started improvising from there. Thank you. Maybe Deborah, you could tell us a little bit about where your histories begin, where your projects start. Well, um, the project uh, denial or my Holocaust uh, denial work starts actually here in Israel. Um, I had finished my first book. Well, actually. I'll tell you that story in a minute. Hold that story. Hold that thought. Um, most of my books begin with a question, a problem. My first, very first book, Beyond Belief, The American Press and the Holocaust, began when I was teaching a course on the history of the Holocaust. And I had reached a point where I was talking about the bystanders. And um, I was talking about how much information had gotten out. So I was tracking information that had come via Geneva and gotten to uh, Stephen S. Wise, information that gotten to the Congress, information that came to the State Department, inf information that came to the, the White House. And then this is how long I've been teaching. One of the students in my class burst out in the middle, and it was a large class, so you don't need, it wasn't etiquette to burst out in the middle like that. And he said, but what could my parents have known? Today they'd say, what could my grandparents have known? Um, and I said, probably a lot, because there was all this information. He said, I, I can't believe you. I can't believe that they would have known and not done something. That's a whole other question. But I decided to go and look and see what could be done. So really, that book began with a question by a student. My project on Holocaust denial was really, uh, I was not particularly interested in it. Those of you who have seen my, my TED talk, which is gotten to 1.1 million views. <laughs> Usually in Jewish life, when you're talking over a million, you're talking dollars. This is not dollars. <laughs> millions, you know? um, uh, when I first heard about Holocaust denial, I heard about it from Yehuda Bauer. I had been teaching a couple of years. In, at, I was at the University of Washington, and he had come from South Africa, and he had a pamphlet showing on Holocaust denial. And I said, this is ridiculous. You know, this is flat earth theory. This is Elvis is still alive stuff. And I laughed. Uh, then a couple of years later, after I had finished Beyond Belief, I was in Jerusalem. And uh, I had, Yehuda knew I was there. I was at a conference. And he said to me, uh, Yisrael Gutman Nazal, and I have something we want to talk to you about. We have a, a, a project which we think you're, you should really look at. So I was both 
you know, flattered. I was a young scholar and intrigued. So they said, come have coffee with us. So I went to have coffee with, the, with these two giants of history of the Shoah. And they said to me, you should study, we think you should look at Holocaust denial. And again, I laughed, you know, involuntarily, because they're not the kind of people you, you sort of laugh at one of their ideas when you're a junior scholar and these two men, these two giants of, of Holocaust history are, are suggesting something. I said, what? And they said, no, we think it's, we, we, we don't understand why it gains any traction. And, and we think you ought to take a look at it. So I figured it would be two, three year diversion. The academics here know two, three years is a, is a blink of an eye, you know, when it comes to. So you to, don't have to feel. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. right. Little did I know it would shape my life. So that's really how that, that project began. Um, but, you know, the project I'm doing, that I just delivered the manuscript on last week when I was in, in New York, not last, this last week, whenever it was, a few days ago, um, <laughs> on contemporary anti-Semitism um, grows out of um, questions, uh, it's it set up as letters, talking about letters, um, it's set up as letter, interchange with, with, uh, between me and a, a graduating senior, a Jewish student, and a colleague from the law school who's not Jewish, um, who asked me questions, what is anti-Semitism? How do you define it? How do you spell it? With a hyphen, without a hyphen, with a capital, without a capital. Um, what are we seeing today? Is it the same? Is it different? How is it connected to Israel? The two characters are composites. They're fictionalized characters. Um, but the questions they ask all come from questions and interchanges, emails, conversations I've had with students and with colleagues probably since Gaza, so since uh, 2014. So they, more often than not, things grow out of some personal connection. Or the last example I'll give, my book on the Eichmann trial, Jonathan Rosen, a wonderful, wonderful editor, some of you know him, um, who edited uh, Rebecca's book on Spinoza, uh, the for, uh, for editor of the series now a blessed memory, no, the books aren't, but the series is, uh, the next book series, um, came to me and said, we, I think you should write a book on the Eichmann trial. I said, Mali the Eichmann trial, what's my connection? And he said, you don't get it? Uh, he's, and he, he pulled out a, or he cited an editorial that was, I think, in the Times of London, the morning after the verdict in my trial, and it said, um, what the Nuremberg trials and the Eichmann trial did for the preceding century, this trial does for this century. So he said, you can look at this trial with a particular view. So it, it, I've been lucky, I've been really, really, more than lucky, blessed, that I'm able to bring the personal to my historical research. Mm -hmm. I see there's overlap. I do there, too. Um, I wanted to ask both of you about documents in particular, because one of the things that a novelist needs to do is to bring things to life. And sometimes we think of documents as being kind of old and dusty and crumbly and not full of the kind of um, material and physical and embodied sense that daily life might have. And I, it, you're, nonetheless, in Rachel's novel, any of you who've read it know that documents are incredibly dramatic um, and incredibly moving as well. And I was curious what both of you think about, you know, to what extent when you are researching, documents are the heart of the research, and to what extent you're researching other things, perhaps material remnants, perhaps cities themselves, the history of cities. Um, so to talk a little bit about that, and perhaps Rachel might read a section of her novel um, that really deals with the discovery of documents, if you feel like it's the right moment. Oh. Uh, sure, it's up to you, but she's just announced it. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> so I'll do it. But first, just to, to um, fly my absolute book nerd flag for a moment, I just, um, if, if you ever have a chance to go to a rare manuscripts room or a document conservation lab, go. It doesn't even matter if you, you know, if, if anybody gives you any window of opportunity, just go ask to see something old. It doesn't even matter if you don't know what you're doing. Um, it is so beautiful. It's so uh, really incredible to see the original documents. To go and they're you know sometimes they, they make you wear gloves. Sometimes they confiscate your own pencils. You have to use their pencils. Whatever it is, they put the documents on these little pillows. They'll turn the pages for you. Um, you'll see these documents where somebody 400 years ago doodled in the manuscript, and suddenly again it all comes to life. Oh, people were bored then, just like they're bored now. People drew silhouettes of faces. 
people, people's faces look the same then as now. It sort of suddenly makes you realize this isn't some, you know, people walking on out in the ether in history. This was all of us just in a different time period. Um, I got to go to document conservation labs where um, I learned about this form of ink, iron gall ink that uh, some uh, they used to use uh, hundreds of years ago, and some forms of it are stable, and some forms of it actually eat through paper, corrode paper, over the years. It's the most beautiful thing. The words themselves excise themselves from the paper. The words burn their way through paper. So, you know, you can get these pieces of paper that are like a lattice work where the words burn, burn through them. So just, it's, it's a thing of beauty, I think. Um, there's so much excitement in the documents for me, but also researching a, a novel, you also, you have to know everything. And that, I think it's a sort of different kind of research where if my characters are eating a meal, first of all, I need to know what the table manners are. I need to know what utensils are on the table, what foods are on the table. I need to know what people are wearing, how heavy it is. Because remember, you're, you're in their bodies. You have to know how they feel as, you know, wearing these clothing. Is it restrictive, is it not? They want to open a window. What's the window lever like? What's growing in the garden outside the window? So it was a very interactive process. You know, people would say, how long did you research before you started the book? It's not like that. It's, it's, that would be like saying, you know, did you stand on shore and do all the breathing and then swim the mile? It's, you have to sort of go back and forth, write a scene, go research the facts, do the research, get an idea for another scene, books of fashion, books of, you know, everything of the time. Um, I think maybe it's, um, I'll read a little bit, which sort of brings in the reverence for the documents. This is just a couple pages into the book, so there are no spoilers. Um, and I have my character, um, Helen Watt, uh, in this case, she is, um, this is very close to the beginning of the book. Helen is a British non-Jewish historian with a very personal uh, reason from the past for her passion for Jewish history. She is, um, she's only 60, but she is in ill health. Uh, among other things, she has a, um, a hand tremor that means she should not be handling delicate documents. Um, someone said to me later, why did you give Helen a hand tremor? And I realized only later on that it was because I've always loved the, you know, the idea that there would be a historian who's devoted to memory. The thing she treasures most of all is preserving memory, um, and the one thing she can't do literally is touch, touch you know, she has this tremor, she's not supposed to touch the pages. Um, so, okay, I'm just gonna read, this is the moment where Helen has been called by a former student who she doesn't even remember, but he remembers that she has some connection to Jewish history. This is on the outskirts of London. He's, uh, he, he's British and his, he, his wife inherited a 17th century house. They're converting it into an art gallery. And the electrician has opened a staircase to put in some wiring and found these shelves of pack full of paper in the 17th century house. So one of them is signed by a rabbi. Some are in Hebrew, some are in Portuguese. And they basically call Helen to you know, come see these papers, get these papers out of our house so we can finish the renovation. And so she's been called in. And, um, and she's very skeptical that these documents have any value. This is just the, the moment when Ian shows her the papers. There, on a small card table beside the window, was a single, cracked, leather-bound volume. Beside it lay the two pages Ian had told her about over the phone, the first items his electrician had removed from under the staircase upon discovering the documents. For an instant, she allowed herself to stare at the pages, taking in the thick, textured paper she dared not touch, then at the counterpoint of two alphabets on the page, the Portuguese lettering that led from left to right, interrupted by scattered Hebrew phrases that ran in the reverse direction. Slowly she read and reread. Ian's voice coming from just behind her. Over there, he said, and pointed. She lifted her eyes. There, in a dim corner at the base of the staircase, untouched by the blinding light of the landing's windows, was a small panel that had been forced open. Ignoring Ian's tentative offer of help, Helen approached the opening. Lowering herself slowly to the floor, her cane trembling heavily under her weight, she knelt before it like a penitent. She stayed that way for a long time, her hands pressed to the cool floor, and a great heaviness nearly overcame her, as though all her years had suddenly taken on physical weight. For a long while, she simply stared at the crammed shelves, breathing very quietly. Then, finally, knowing she should not, she lifted a quaking hand to remove a single page. A moment only. 
The page, astonishingly, rested unharmed on her two outspread palms, like a bird that had agreed for just this moment to alight there. Thank you. I want to ask Deborah um, if you can tell us a little bit about what are the dramatic finds or the, the contents um, that, that you have met with in your research that have provided you with that kind of, um, that, that kind of response. Yeah, well, okay, and I'm, I'll frame it within the question of documents. Mm, okay. Because when you do Holocaust history, documents are tricky. Um, many of you, if you've studied the history of the Holocaust at all, know Raoul Holberg's magisterial work, um, The Destruction of European Jewry. And in it, uh, uh, Professor Hilberg uh, relied only on German documents. I mean, the docu most of the documents we have are, when you want to talk about a formal document, are German documents. But he very clearly, I don't know if it's in the book or it's subsequent to that in other places that he wrote about this, he eschewed using survivor testimony because he felt it wasn't trustworthy. But the documents were trustworthy. Now, his book comes out in 61. Um, and you know it's the first real history of the destruction process. But, but he was very intent on using German documents. Over the course of following years, as the field of Holocaust <coughs> studies grew, and it's amazing when you think what this field start, started from and, how, and what it has become, um, historians began to realize that uh, you couldn't just rely. The German documents are telling. I mean, I, and again, I don't want to besmirch in any way uh, Hilberg's work. In fact, those of you who know Lanzmann Shoah know the interview with Hilberg <coughs> in his home in Burlington, where Lanzmann, where he shows Lanzmann one document. It's it's a train schedule of a train that went fr to, from a couple of German, uh, I'm sorry, Polish villages to Treblinka and how many people it would pick up. This one document, and he shows it, it's a train schedule, it starts here, it goes there, it stops and picks up these, starts here and goes here, and how many people it will pick up in each place. And uh, he finishes, and I'm paraphrasing here, Lanzmann's, you know, the documentary is nine and a half hours long, so it's easy to get the exact wording wrong, but he says, this document represents 10,000 lives. You know, nothing to stay, you know, there's nothing you can say. But over the course of time, we realized that German um, documents and German footage as well, film footage. Some of you may know the wonderful film, A Film Unfinished by the Israeli filmmaker Yael, blocking on her last name. Um, it's a fabulous film. Uh, she used footage, she didn't discover the footage, but she used footage that was found in a former East Berlin warehouse, Nazi film footage that was just marked ghetto never been processed, I mean, it had been processed, but never been uh, made into a finished film. Obviously, they were going to make some film about the Warsaw Ghetto. And in it, you'll see, in the rough cuts, you see uh, <coughs> footage that makes it into documentaries on the ghetto. But you see that these shots have been set up because there's the first take, the second take. Many of you have seen uh, documentaries on the Warsaw Ghetto with Jews just walking by uh, uh, children sitting on the street starving or something. Well, in this film, you see the first take, the second take. In other words, these things were, not to say these things didn't happen, but they're set up. She shows you how, how they were trying to structure a particular view of the ghetto. So um, you have to be very careful with, with strictly German documents. And, and over the course of time, um, as we got a larger collection of survivor memoirs, diaries, uh, testimonies, et cetera, um, we realized that you can, I don't know if triangulate is the right word, but use both. And the person who did this so, many people have done it very well, but Shaul Friedlander did this so magnificently in his two volume work, one, the first one on history of German Jews, uh, the, the persecution from 33 to uh, 39, and then in his Pulitzer Award winning, um, I think the years of extermination it's called, uh, where he uh, uses a German document Tell, ties it in with the memoir and does it so so powerfully. Someone and and it's stories. 
You know, I, I just said, I, I, this is the first novel. Um, my sins, I do confess, the first novel I've read in years. I read it in a week. Um, I was taking a lot of overseas flights, so I don't know whether the flights made reading it faster or that made the flights go faster. I think a little bit of both. Um, but um, it's stories. There's a wonderful book of stories. If you want to get a sense, and I have my students read this whole book in my History of the Holocaust class by, by Marion Kaplan, who teaches at NYU, a, a book called Between Dignity and Despair. German Jews, German, or the German Jewish community, German Jews, 1933 to 45. And Marion is a feminist historian, not just that she writes about women, but she wants to go beyond the official documents and newspapers to get into the day-to-day -day life. What was it like for a, a German um, middle-class woman who never worked outside the home? Her husband is arrested, and she's told, if, if you get all the papers together in three weeks, uh, we'll release him, and then you can leave the country. And suddenly, she's going to the bank, she's going to the, the paying the bills and getting visas. And, and all. what was it like to send your children to school when you knew their teacher was a Nazi? What was it like to go to school when your teacher was a Nazi? What was it like if you were a mixed marriage family, and um, your wife's mother came to uh, live with you, and she was an Ary so-called Aryan, and you were a Jew? So she really captures, and she captures one anecdote that, that just again, stories. Um, it's from a memoir, uh, uh, or a diary, I forget which, of a woman in Dortmund, small town, um, in February 33, she writes. She's writing about February 33. So it's three weeks, four, uh, maybe a, less than a month, since the uh, Nazis came to power. And this woman had been part of a coffee clutch you know, every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, she and four other friends would meet in the cafe for an hour, drink coffee. They had their alcove, it was reserved for them, and uh, that had been going on for years. Well, after January 30th, 1933, she stopped going. So two, three weeks she hadn't gone. One day she meets one of the women on the street. The woman says to her, why did you stop coming? You must come back. She was the only Jew in the group. You must come back to us. We want you there. You must not let this man frighten you from joining us. So she says, OK, next time I will come. And she writes about what we would say she was going to, she would watch their body language. She doesn't use that term, but that's what, you know, to see if they were uncomfortable, whether she would continue coming. Uh, was they really serious about her wanting to be there? She'd go this time, and she she'd decide whether she would continue. And she describes how she got to the cafe precisely at 11 and looked over at the alcove where they always met, and no one was there. Now, if you want to know how fast things went downhill, that story will capture my students' interest more than by saying, by February 33, so many Jews already were preparing to emigrate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I always try to find the stories. Um, but you, you asked about things that I, I the reason I, I opened this is that um, what happened in my trial um, is that we, were, we really tried to mesh documents with material evidence, to bring together different sources as much as possible. And we had one amazing experience, and there's a picture of it in, in the book. Uh, we um, went to um, auschwitz Birkenau. and I went with the lawyers. I described that visit. It's also depicted in the movie. It was a very difficult visit. Um, it was difficult between me and the lawyers. It was difficult being in, it wasn't my first time there, but I hadn't been there many times on a forensic trip, you know, uh, uh, it was to look at, at one point, our expert witness who was with us, Rob, Professor Robert Jan van Pelt, said to the lawyers, I want you to walk the perimeter of Birkenau. And, and uh, my barrister, the guy in the wig, said, um, why, Robert Jan? This is not a memorializing trip. This is a forensic trip. Um, and he said, well, I want you to get a scope of how large it is. And, and it does play into what happened. Um, but we, before we went to visit the camp itself, we were in the Ashford's archives. And we saw the plans, the architectural plans, drawings, uh, for the gas chambers. And there are two of them. Those of you who've been to Auschwitz-Birkenau know if you go all the way at the end to the train line, that train spur that goes all the way through, you see the ruins of two gas chambers there. 
And then at the far end, if you're facing the iconic gate, at the far end on the right side, there are ruins of some other gas chambers. Um, in those ruins of those gas chambers and the plans we have for them, there are um, drawings, uh, I think it's 12 windows, of a sh window shutters, so to speak, or windows of a certain proportion. In the archive, we also found a work order, 12 windows, 12 gas type windows of exactly those proportions. So you have the plans for 12 windows, you have a work order for 12 windows of exactly that proportion. Then you have testimony given at the Auschwitz Frankfurt trial in the early 60s, right two years after the Eichmann trial, um, of one of the people who worked in, the, in, in that gas chamber, a, a, a German, who described opening the window shutter and th in those gas chambers the gas was thrown in through, the can was thrown in through the window. So we had those three pieces, and then we were taken, we were taken when we went on this uh, forensic visit, they took us into storerooms and, and, and various things which people don't get to see and, and now are closed once again. And there we found, and there's a picture in the book, we found a window shutter of exactly the proportion of described in the um, drawings and in the work order. Um, with the remnants of the rubber seal um, in the shutter and the handle on the outside. You know, if you've ever put windows in your house, when they come, you can tell what's inside, what goes inside, and what goes outside. <coughs> they, now, if you have a window in a room, you don't have the handle on the outside unless you want, don't want the people on the inside to be able to open it. I mean, it's completely counterintuitive. So there we had the document the plans, the work order, the testimony of the German, and the physical evidence. And that was a really uh, powerful, powerful moment of, of the coming together of the various things. Thank you. I'm thinking about how both with the documents and with that story where you have those, those different dimensions and those different components, that there's something about studying history where you're confronted with the thing itself and not a representation of it and not something you know twice removed or three times removed, but the thing itself. And one of the things that struck me in The Weight of Ink as being especially beautiful is how, pro how prominent the sense of touch is in the novel, mm -hmm. that, that what Helen wants what Aaron wants, they want to touch the documents. It's not enough to see them. And of course, as you say, Helen has this tremor that makes it very dangerous. She might destroy the things she touches. And there are the librarians who are hovering over the documents, you know, trying to, trying to protect them. But there's something about the kind of unmediated access to the past that we feel through our fingers in a strange way. And I wanted to read a very short passage from a wonderful book called Touch by Gabriel Vajasopovici. Um, <coughs> He describes going to the Pacific Ocean and seeing it and then realizing it's not enough to see it. He actually has to touch it. Um, and he says, um, all I am sure about is that this was something I felt driven to do and that now I know in some obscure way that I have been on the other side of the world and made contact with one of the world's great oceans. I would not, of course, have made any special effort to go all the way there only to dip my hand into the Pacific. As I was there, though, it felt right, even important, that I should do so. Why it should be important is a mystery to me, but there it is. A friend who recently visited Rome for the first time since adolescence told me he had never been in a city where he had felt so great a desire simply to touch. When I asked him why, he simply said, I suppose it's because there's such a sense of antiquity about it. You could say this, I think, about many places in Israel as well. Everything there seems to stretch back so far. But why, I asked him, had he not been content merely to see? Why had he felt the need to touch? I really don't know, he said. And then, I suppose touching something confirms its presence. Its presence to you, but also your presence to it. The doubleness is crucial. And I wanted to ask you about that, the, the, recipro the reciprocity between the document find, for instance, and the historian who touches it. Um, that there's something, it's not just that the historian wants to touch the document, there's some sense, there's some <coughs> mystical sense, I think, in your novel that the document wants to touch Helen, mm -hmm. the document wants to touch Aaron, that it's destined in some, in some um, kind of purposeless but purposeful way mm -hmm. for these recipients. 
and that it's their moment that has arrived. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just speak to that. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I was, as you were reading that, I was thinking, well, th this isn't too much of a spoiler, but one of the final gestures in the novel is, uh, is the woman putting her hand in the river. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, I, do f I do feel that, you know, when, when Helen finds these documents in that segment I read, these are documents that were left behind by this 17th century fictitious woman character, Esther Velasquez. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the physical act of writing and that, um, I, I think part of that is my own awareness of um, how much more remote the keyboard feels, how much we used to know, um, not only our, our, only our own handwritings, remember when you knew all your friends' hands writing, handwritings? I, at a certain point I realized that I hadn't handwritten anything other than my own lists and condolence cards in many years. So I, st I got in the habit of, of starting to handwrite letters to some friends again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and that felt important. So that, you know, that, that physical contact with the, with the words. But the, um, there's also something about Helen finding the documents. I thought, again, I didn't know because I didn't outline in advance, but these are going to change her life. This contact with history is going to change her life. But I also think that, and you know, now I'm going off in some maybe a more meta direction, but contact with this history changes me. And, That's and I when I'm writing it, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm writing it, I'm thinking, I don't know if anyone will ever read it, but I hope that that, that contact with the history has some impact on other people. And I, I'm, this may be going too far afield, but it's, um, I was so careful about the research, uh, down to, you know, tiny little things and making sure I got the right line from a Judeo-Portuguese medieval document to put into a deathbed scene and, you know, um, and my son's in the back there. My kids were just like, Mom, what is that? Nobody's going to know. And I was like, no, some will, will know. know. Some will know and they'll write to me about it. But also, um, also felt important to um, have every piece of the history feel real and right because I was weaving a fictitious story. But I wanted to be able to say, you know, this, this character, so I, I have, you know, from based on what I said, it shouldn't be a big surprise to say that I was trying to write about a, a woman who did not die without writing a word, who found a way through creating a deception to do this. And so I felt like people are gonna say, you know, look, there was no such person, obviously this is fictitious, we know no woman did this because we have the names of all, you know, six women from the 17th century who wrote anything approaching philosophy, they were all nobility, wealthy, childless, certainly not Jewish, um, and uh, obviously this didn't happen. And I, it was really important to me to say, yeah, and Esther Velasquez is a fictitious character, but every fact in here, to the best of my ability, and I work very hard for it, is true, is accurate, and I think this story could have happened, and how do we know that someone didn't do something like this? Because if you think about what it took, you know, there, what people, people try to do what the grass does, they try to grow up through pavement, most don't succeed, but some do. When there are restrictions, just because something's against the rule doesn't mean people aren't doing it. People are, you know, you think about all the generations of people who had something to express, maybe it was forbidden, maybe because they were female, maybe because they were Jewish, maybe because they were poor, they didn't have the access. Some, very few managed to do it. And to do it, they had to do it under a white Christian man's name, usually. We know now that a lot of the music we think is Felix Mendelssohn's was actually written by his sister Fanny. Uh, there are a lot of stories like that. I would not be hubristic enough to think that we have found all the women who have done that. So how do we know that someone didn't do something like this? So my personal contact with the history was very much feeling like I wanted to find a path where someone could have done this, whether or not we can actually identify that, that somebody did. Can I just please add, in terms of documents, uh, first of all, uh, to begin with a non uh, how, well, it's sort of Holocaust related, but not exactly story. I was in Sarajevo a couple of years ago, and I, was, I happened to have dinner sitting next to the head of the Sarajevo Jewish community. He was so happy I was there, and I was, you know, whatever, <coughs> and seen the book, he knew there was a movie in the works, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, well, have you seen everything you want to see? And I said, no. He said, well, what do you want to see? I, want to see, I said, I want to see the Haggadah. Mm -hmm. of which I have a facsimile copy, as many of you do. And he arranged for, uh, you know, they, they hid the Haggadah, they put it in a bank vault uh, during the, the war, during the siege of Sarajevo, the recent siege during the Balkans War, one of the many, but the most recent one. Um, and they, he, he told me the story, they insured it for, I don't know, a, 
uh, uh, 10 million dice, that how do you ensure something that is one of a kind? Now, I know the Haggadah, because it's one of the Haggadahs that I always have on my table and it's in my library that I take out to bring to the Seder or at my Seder or whatever. But they brought it up, and of course the archivist had very, uh, had gloves oh, on, super, yeah. super careful gloves, and she did turn one or two pages, and you know what knocked me over? There are wine stains on the Sarajevo Haggadah. <laughs> <laughs> that made me so happy. First of all, the wine stains on all my Haggadahs, but it meant it was used. It wasn't a, uh, a, a collector's item, let's put, I mean, I have a, a facsimile of David Moss's I got as I'm sure some of you do as well. I don't bring that anyway near the, <laughs> the table. table, you know? I, I'm sure if I told David, he'd tell me, go pour a little wine on it, Deborah. But there are wine stains on the Sarajevo Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if they made it into the facsimile or not, mm -hmm. but, but it was just so, I almost cried. Mm -hmm. Pe real people use this Haggadah. And real people spilled wine on this kind of um, But there, and you know, with me, with the documents I deal with, and, and uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm doing, I'm not doing the exact research on the history, but still, we ran into many of them uh, for the trial and also for the Eichmann book. There was, there's a, a woman who gave testimony at the Eichmann trial, and um, her husband had been. Uh, deported in the Hungarian deportation, which as you know, took place seven weeks from right after Pesach through the beginning of July 1944. Half a million people deported, of which over 400,000 were murdered at uh, Beer Canal. Um, and one man who had been deported uh, had written a letter on the train and threw it out the window. Um, and he wrote, if whoever finds this letter will post it, may they be blessed or something. And, and she got it. And um, you know, she, it was used in the trial, she couldn't read it. So um, I think Gavi Bach, who was the, doing the questioning, uh, Gabriel Bach, uh, read it, who was Hausner's assistant, then Hausner's assistant. Um, but it was, it, it's so powerful because, you know, and I've seen, I've seen it at Yad Vashem, um, somewhat, you know, it, 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 comes, it comes with the tear stains, not the wine stains. Um, and, and once I had this amazing experience, I was in Warsaw, this goes back quite a few years, and it was when they were redoing one of the uh, buildings of the, adjacent to the synagogue in, in the center of Warsaw. And I was walking through with Michael Shudrick, Rabbi Michael Shudrick, the chief rabbi of Warsaw, and he showed me a piece of crumpled up paper. And it was a huge drawing, I believe. And he said that the building was being redone, and as the workmen lifted the floorboards to put in new floorboards, they, or the wall boards, they found the walls stuffed with paper as insulation. And these were kids' drawings from the Warsaw Ghetto that had been used to stuff. And, and it's a kid's drawing. Does it have documentary value? No, in terms of telling us, but does it have <coughs> historical knock your socks off, you know, lay you, render you dumb? Yes. So, you know, the documents are there and they tell a story. Deborah, I wanted to ask you if you could maybe tell us if there have ever been mysteries in your research that you couldn't solve through the kind of typical historian's tactics Ooh. and whether imagination ever matters. Um, because Rachel's talking about you know, the way in which you take all this information that you gather and all the facts and the linguistic, the lexicon, and then you think about what's probable you know, or what is possible. And you have the license as a novelist to do that. And I'm curious, I mean, Deborah, your, your, your life's work is a commitment to reconfiguring the facts and to, to really showing that facts matter, that fake news is fake and that real news is real. And, and I'm curious if there are moments where you feel that you have to make a leap, you have to think what um, might be. Not so much in the history, and of course now I've become, um, you should pardon the expression, Haredi when it comes to facts because um, uh, I, I say that only because I'm, I, but, it, but you know, 
medactic or whatever, exacting, because I know how they can be misused. And that's why when I was so intrigued by this pairing, because I think one of the first things I said to you, I, I did, before I said hello in the lobby, I said, uh, I was, uh, maybe I didn't say it, maybe I held back uncharacteristically. <laughs> but now I'll say it while we have an audience. <laughs> okay. um, that I loved the book. I learned a tremendous amount of the book, from the book. But would you take the few liberties you took if you were writing about my topic? Mm -hmm. I don't answer because you, you know you can. I know maybe you can, but I, you know it's it's a hard one. But I'll tell you where I've run into a problem recently on this book I just finished on contemporary anti-Semitism, which was a very difficult book to write because um, I mean I, I I'm always skulking in the sewers of Jew hatred, so this was you know not that different, except. Um, this, well, generally I'm writing about what was, and here I'm writing about what is. And at some point, this, I have to, because my students ask me why, you know, and, and there is no real answer to the why. Or I'm not the one to answer the why, you know, don't ask the woman who was raped why the guy raped her, ask the rapist. You know, Holocaust studies shouldn't be in Jewish studies. They should be in general European history or mm. Christian studies if there was such a thing or whatever. Um, but, but yet, you, that's not satisfying to a student. Um, and yet, you know, you can talk about prejudice. You can talk about uh, prejudice, you know, the, the absurdity of prejudice prejudge to make up your mind. Don't confuse me with the facts I've made up my mind. I see an African American, I know they are, quote, shiftless and lazy. I see an Italian, I know he has mafioso connections. I see a pretty blonde student, I know she's dumb. Um, and it's, it's, it's not funny, it's, it's the same kind of prejudice. Um, and I see a Jew and I know that they're conniving, um, cheating. Um, and of course, that has its roots in the story of the, the death, of the crucifixion of Jesus. That's the New Testament and how it has been taught. You know, and even Holocaust denial. One of the things I, I can't, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm just, you know, freeing <laughs> associating here. So, um, and I'll stop in a minute. Um, but Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism. That's what I, one of the, one of the things I, when I came back to Bauer, to, to Professors Bauer and, and Gutmann, um, that's why I said, this is classic anti-Semitism. The Jews, you know, you ask the question, we, uh, people, if you ask people the question, what did the Jews get out of the Holocaust, in quotation marks? The traditional answer given is what? Yes. Which is, as you should know better than anyone, is incorrect, because there would have been some Jewish entity in 1936 with a PO commission. There would have been something. And the people who would have populated the state were killed, but, but that's the perception. Israel, and what else did Jews get out of the Holocaust? Reparations, a fancy word for it, money. There you have it. Why, according to the way the New Testament story was ta has been taught, why did the Jews, the Jews, kill Jesus? Of course, Jesus was a Jew, the Jews were Jews, everybody was Jewish, except the Romans who crucified him, but that's a fact, and we don't worry about those. Um, you know, in the teaching, the, the church fathers who taught this story, and I use fathers purposely, um, <coughs> ignored that fact. Well, why did they do it? Because um, he wanted to chase the money changers out of the temple, and also he was presenting himself as the next step. I am, I'm, you don't need the law, I come in its place. But they were willing to do that to, to harm this innocent being, deprive multitudes of generations of his teaching for their own financial benefit. So too they have made up this story about the Shoah, why? Because that's the question you ask. Well, what's in it for them? Well, they deprived the people of their land. They got the money. It fits to the end. Anybody who was the least bit anti-Semitic, and that's like being a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. But anybody who's been exposed to the Western world has been exposed to anti-Semitism. That's like anybody who's grown up in the United States has been exposed to racism. You can't ignore it. 
You fight it, but you can't ignore it. And so to the person who is inclined towards believing the anti-Semitic story, it makes sense, it's logical. So how do you explain an illogical phenomenon to a student and the students, I mean, we, we, you know, they encounter anti-Semitic incidents, they encounter anti-Israel incidents, and, and they come and they, why? Why? And you can't just say, you know, Esav Sonei et Yaakov, uh, you know, Le'olam, what is it? I forget exactly how it goes. But you can't just say this goes on forever. And, and, and yet there is, you can't give a logical answer to it. The reason you can't give a logical answer is because it's an illogical thing. You can't answer an illogical thing with a logical thing. My last anecdote on this, and, and then I'll stop, is uh, uh, many years ago I was teaching a course on films of the Holocaust. And I was, I, and I was teaching with a film expert you know, from my department, and she, she did films, and, and particularly films of religion, and we were in the religion department, and I did the Holocaust. So the way the course was structured, we met Tuesdays and Thursdays for lectures, so, and Wednesday night for a film. So Tuesday, let's say we're going to see Garden of the Finzi Cantinis or a film unfinished. So on Tuesday, I would lecture about the Warsaw Ghetto or the Garden of Finzi Cantinis on Italian uh, Jews and the Holocaust. We'd see the film, and then she would do a film analysis with the class based on the history and the film. And it was early in the semester, and we were seeing propaganda films. Lenny Riefenstahl, Jude Zeus, um, Eternal Jew, all the, you know, the, the various horrible uh, propaganda films. And um, I was lecturing, it was the Tuesday, and I was lecturing on um, um, Nazi anti-Semitism and the, the way they characterized the Jews, etc. And my colleague and I, it was a large class, and a room like this, and we had agreed we wouldn't interrupt each other, unlike a <coughs> seminar where you're sitting around the table and you could have informal conversation. But each person who was lecturing would turn to the other and say, do you have something you want to add? So I'm talking about Nazi anti-Semitism, and a student raises her hand and says, but weren't all the, doctor, the, the lawyers and bankers in Germany Jews? And I'm taken aback. Now, this is a class students had to want to take. It was at 8.30 in the morning. You weren't you know, there by lack of choice, and they had a fight to get into it. So she wasn't a plant you know, or something. And I looked at her, and I began to answer with facts and figures. I said, no, there were uh, fewer than 600,000 Jews in Germany. Germany had 60 million people. There were you know, only so many. And, there were that. And, and, and I'm giving her all these. And then my colleague, uh, Barbara Di Concini, not a member of our tribe, a former nun, stands up while I'm giving the answer, looks at the student and says, so what? That was the right answer. I was the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. I was trying to answer an irrational, she was saying, well, the Jews were the uh, bankers and the lawyers, therefore they deserve to be hated, therefore they, she said, so what? That's the right answer. You know, so sometimes the non-answer is the right. I know Rachel has a number of things she's waiting oh, to say. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, we need about six hours to have this conversation. I know, I know. 10,000 things. Um, so, um, and I, I know you weren't trying to put me on the spot to answer this question, but I do want to um, take up this question of, you know, taking, you know, would I have written this way or, or taken liberties um, with the Holocaust? I think, first of all, like, I was so careful. I didn't take liberties with any facts, and I'm a real stickler with that, and I think I'm in a minority among fiction right. writers. Most fiction writers, when they're researching history, they're like, well, you know, it was close to this. It was okay. You know, I was crazy about the facts, I think because I, I wanted to be able to say this could have happened, and I wanted to be really careful about my facts. So the only, you know, I, I think there was one uh, thing I discovered as we were going into copy editing that a program I said existed in Israel in 1960 didn't exist till 1968. There was nothing I could do to change it. So I put in my put acknowledgments, I, I said that. this program was, you know, so I make it sound like I did it on purpose. It was like, I just, get it. but at least I was like, okay, look, this, I wanted to make sure that that fact was corrected in there. So certainly I would be all the more so about the Holocaust and also I would be very hesitant to write fiction about the Holocaust just because of my own, family background, I would feel like I wanted to write nonfiction. But there's a, so I don't feel concerned so much about taking liberties with the facts. I want to talk, if we can, a little bit about taking liberties with the truth, because this is something I worry about a lot, and maybe particularly in American context as a fiction writer. And I'll, I'll make this as brief as I can. When I was in grad school, 
I almost left grad school in my first semester. I went to an MFA program, MA program in creative writing. And um, if I'd come to this program, you wouldn't have thought it was, well, <laughs> I wouldn't have been a problem for, for the reason that I almost left. So um, most workshops, as those of you who have been in workshops know basic workshop etiquette. If I'm the person being workshopped, I bring in my story, um, you know, and somebody's leading the workshop and they lead it, you all discuss my story. I'm not allowed to speak until the end. And then I have time where I can say, hey, well, you know, I can disagree, I can ask questions, whatever, the writer has a chance to speak. My first semester in grad school, I had a teacher who had a very unusual and I think pretty controlling approach to the classroom. The writer was never allowed to speak, not even in the end, not to ask a question, nothing. You went in silent, you walked out silent. Um, which, okay, you know, I can have a thick skin about my writing. But I was writing my first couple pieces. One was, uh, um, had to do with Holocaust survivors, and one was set in, in Israel. It actually became the first chapter of my novel, From a Sealed Room. I wrote that my first semester in grad school. And I brought it in, and I had to sit there silently and listen to a bunch of um, non-Jewish readers discuss it based on inaccurate assumptions about Israel and about Jews. And sometimes the instructor would chime in and say, well, clearly the mother wouldn't have done this because, you know, the, because there was a war going on. There was no war going on in Israel at the time. You know, well, I don't see why these characters don't sleep together because Israel's a promiscuous country. You know, saying, and I'm not allowed to say anything. And so I went to the instructor at the end and I said, listen, I, can I ask a question? Can, if something is just an error, can I? And she said, no. And I went, uh, I ran into a friend on the street and uh, at the time, and he said, hey, I'm going to hear Elie Wiesel speak. I've never heard Elie Wiesel speak. And I just, I was watching him speak and it was like that moment where you realize that there's somebody you need, somebody's voice you need in your life on something. And I was like, that's it. I need, I need him to tell me what to, because I was thinking like, I'm going to, so I'm going to, Armor clad my writing. You know you can do this. You can write the sentence that said, uh, she said goodbye to him, he was walking out the door, and there wasn't a war at the time. You know, and I mean you can you can dumb down your writing so badly and make a terrible cloddy writing, but make sure that the facts are not going to be misused, that the truth won't be misused or spun in some weird way. And it, it makes for really awful writing. And so I listened to Ellie Wiesel and I went home. And you know, was embarrassed that I'd done this, but I wrote this absolute heartfelt, you know, three, four page single space letter about this experience I was having in grad school, whatever. I sent it, I thought, you know, I'm never gonna hear back from him, but I wrote it. And um, and this was when he was going back and forth to Bosnia, and you'd see pictures of him in the flak jacket and the helmet. And, and he wrote back. He wrote back. And it was um, it was he thanked me for writing. I mean, it was just the most gracious thing anyone's ever done. And he said, uh, you know, in haste. Um, uh, be true, something, I can't believe I'm freezing up now, I can't remember the exact words, I have it framed on my wall, um, but it was, uh, be true to, true to your own voice, let no other voice cover your own. So I stayed in grad school, and I said, okay, I'm going to write what I write, and I'm going to try to write well and not dumb it down, because I worry about anti-Semitic interpretations. But there were limits, so when I was <coughs> copy editing my first novel, and I knew it was going to be published in the U.S., and I also had a, a contract for a German publication, and I was traveling in Poland with my mother at the time, and I was on deadline, so I was back at the hotel room in Krakow, and I was copy editing. And um, there was a point where um, I, and I had deliberately done sort of fly the flag of artistic freedom, right? That, that you know, I was, I was trying to depict things as they are, the full range of human behavior. So there are wonderful, uh, you know, there are Jews who are kind, and there are Jews who are unkind. There are Jews, you know, the only reason you would write only Jews who are kind and never manipulative or never greedy is if you're trying to be prescriptive and write the book that's good for the Jews. But again, that can get really cloddy. You're trying to write a, a, you know, a very careful book to make sure no one misinterprets. So I had dozens and dozens of Jewish characters, and I had this one tiny reference to somebody's greedy cousin in a Polish Jewish community. And I deliberately put it in there going, OK, I'm just going to let us be people. And on the bell curve of humanity, there are people in every nation. There, there are some greedy people. There's some, and I put it in there just to say, I'm not going to restrict myself based on what are the, what are the anti-Semites think. But you know what? I was copy editing in a hotel room in Krakow. And I'm thinking, this is going to be in Germany. And I had in my head, there's that reader in Germany who's going to think, yeah, I always heard Jews were greedy. I cut the sentence. Now, was that the right thing? Was that the wrong thing? I had to be able to sleep at night. So I worry about, not about getting the facts wrong, because I'm, I'm crazy about trying to get my facts right. I worry about trying to write fiction that is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Trying to describe the world as it is, 
which means the full variety of human behavior and how that's going to be used and twisted out in the world. I learned, I, my question wasn't in any way um, a, a, a aggressive or oh, no, no, assertive. That no, if it's a man, we would have mm -hmm. said assertive. If it's women, we would say right. aggressive. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I wasn't, uh, because I, A, I learned so much from your book. I, I learned, it just was amazing. And what I did know about that period was absolutely confirmed for me. And um, and your acknowledgments of, of what the sources you used in the book on the history of, of London, and, and it just was, you know, this is a novel I would, I read and I would read, you know, I'll read the others too, you know, so <laughs> it's, um, it, I, I wasn't asking, but I, I just, the question is, how far can you go? You know, yeah. there was the film, the Hungarian film two years ago, Son of Sam, um, a son, son of Saul, Sam, Son of Saul, that's another one. So it's been, I'm, I'm a little jet lag. Um, I've been popping back and across the ocean. Um, uh, the story, I think, was ridiculous, but the depiction of the characters was so powerful. Um, uh, it won the Academy Award for, for foreign films. Um, and it just was exceptionally powerful. Um, I, my, I couldn't write fiction. I could barely write a memoir. This is a sort of a memoir of my experience. Uh, someone complimented me on writing a memoir in which there was no personal information. <laughs> you notice? <laughs> you know? um, uh, I see Ilana Kershan is here, and she'll be speaking on the, the final night. Y your memoir is so honest and so open in 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 just uh, an amazing way. I have to tell this, the anecdote I told you about. Um, I was at a uh, Shabbat meal a couple months ago. And I was reading your book, uh, If All the Seas Were Ink, and one, uh, this Ilana <laughs> cited in her introduction. And I said, I'm reading this wonderful book, and it's, uh, you know, If All the Seas Were And someone across the table said, oh, it's a great book. And we talked about how the author weaves together different strands. And we were both very complimentary. And the other one said, and the way she goes from the 17th century to the <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I'm three quarters of the way through Kershaw's book. I didn't find this. And then I said, maybe you mean the Talmud, the, the, the 5th century, the 6th century. She said, no, no, the 17th century. And now we realized I was talking about if all the seats were ink, and they were talking about the way to be. It happens uh, all the time. You know, so, uh, you wrote that book, the seats. You two should go on the road together. That's <laughs> Well, I think the conclusion we can draw is that we're in the hands of some wonderful writers in this room, um, novelists, historians, memoirists, poets.